Good to have you back. We're going to talk about common savings plans today. And as I go through this particular topic that we have, you know, there's a lot of different titles for what we have on savings plans. But I want to impress something upon you first. I want to give you a quote. Um, it's from Aristotle. I think it is just as appropriate today as it was when it was written so very long ago. First, have a definite, clear, practical ideal, a goal, an objective. Second, have the necessary means to achieve your ends, wisdom, money, material, and methods. And then third, adjust all your means to that end. And I really think this is something that can apply to your finances and when we're talking about titling of accounts and those type of things. So we can talk about a lot of things today. So we're going to cover some 401k, 401k Roth, solo 401k, 403b, 457 IRA, simple IRA, Roth IRA, SEP IRA. Are you familiar with UTMA, UGMA, 529, qualified annuities, non qualified annuities, a pension plan that could be tax-free and is life insurance based. There are a ton of different titles that we can use for savings. I'm going to spend a minute on a 457 plan. Now with a 457 plan, you have a pre-tax payroll deduction on that account. Now you may have contributions from your employer, you may not. There are many different in vendors that provide services on this platform. A lot of them are going to be internet based where you're choosing allocations and models and that type of thing. Now, with you working on this on a pre-tax payroll deduction, that is going to reduce the amount of your taxable income now. However, you are deferring the taxes to a later point in time. Generally, we're looking at retirement, you know, after 59 and a half. Now, a very popular provider for this is TIAA Craft. They are not exclusive in this market. It is portable when you leave, but that's probably a vendor that you are familiar with. Let's talk a little bit about an IRA, or if you have a non-working spouse, we might do a spousal IRA, even if you don't see the word spousal in front of it. So we can have two people in the household with only one earning wages. If you qualify, you can also do an IRA for the non-working spouse. Now an IRA, again, that's going to be pre-tax. So you are deducting it off of your tax return now. And all of the deposits and the accumulations are going to be taxable when you take them out in the future, a little bit down the road. How Well, what do you put an IRA in? It could be a variety of things. Uh, you could work with your bank and you could do a CD. You could do annuities, fixed annuities, variable annuities, equity indexed annuities. You could do mutual funds. Uh, you could have that in a self-directed IRA and you may own real estate or mutual funds within it. There are some special provisions, but sometimes that works out for you. Now, there is also what is known as the 401k Roth or the 401k Roth IRA. Now, these are a little different. You're not going to be able to deduct them from your tax return now. However, those proceeds are going to go into the account after tax, so they will never be taxed again. And then in addition to that, all of the accumulations are going to be tax-free as long as you stay within a couple of pretty easy rules. Well, what types of things could you put into a 401k Roth? Usually those are gonna be through your company-based platform most of the time. You may have a cash asset account or a money market, and then you're gonna have mutual fund type accounts to choose from. That's the most common. Now, if you are doing an individual Roth IRA, you have a little bit of different options. Once again, we could go back to the bank for a CD. We could look at doing mutual funds. We could possibly do a stocks, depending upon the platform you use. You might want to use annuities. And we go back to the fixed annuities, variable annuities, equity indexed annuities. Now, if you do that very special self-directed Roth IRA, you may own real estate within that. Maybe it's rental properties, uh, might be a business interest. So there are some other ways that you can do that when you have some larger balances. And there are some other things that you want to accomplish. We need to talk about our self-employed individuals. You know, there's quite a few of us out there. 
Now with the self-employed, you can do several different plans. My preference really is the individual 401k. If you are a sole proprietor, this can work out for you very, very well. As an individual 401k, there's generally no vesting because you as the employer can put the money in, which is great when you are doing the profit sharing from your net self-employment income. The reason this is great is because you are able to deduct that company contribution and you are not going to pay self-employment taxes on it and you're not going to pay income taxes on it, especially if you are using a Schedule C, for example. Now, you will end up paying taxes on those pre-tax contributions later, but depending upon your tax bracket, there is nothing that says that you couldn't put it in and then turn around and convert it over to a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA, paying the taxes on it and then having it tax-free going forward. So we've got a lot of options with the individual 401k. We also have much larger contribution limits than what is available. You know, we could easily go up to $50,000, maybe a little more. That may not be available on some of the other options. Well, if you're self-employed besides the 401k, you could do an SEP IRA. Now, the SEP IRA, that's limited to 25% of what your profit is. So again, depending upon the dynamics of how we arrange assets, that may or may not be enough to accomplish what you want to accomplish. There's also a simple IRA. It's very simple. It is got a little different rules on it. It is pre-tax also. But with that particular one, the employer... You, if you're a self-employed individual, has the opportunity to match between 1% and 3% of your annual wages. And for a self-employed person, that's going to be your net profit after all of your business expenses. So there is a little bit of matching that's available there, but it does have a ceiling. With those accounts, you're going to see that you're going to pay taxes later. So it could be an option. Now, what about doing a defined benefit plan for your self-employed individuals? Now, those are something that is available. It's on a much higher level, has a different way that we calculate what the required contributions are going to be and what the maximums are. And it depends on what we're trying to accomplish. So with the divine benefit plan, you may be targeting that you want to create a $5,000 a month income starting when you're age 65 until age 85 or until your death. So there are different ways that those are calculated and are handled from year to year. Now, um, they're really best for proprietors who are going to have much larger amounts of funds that they can set aside and they can put into this, especially if you're a little bit older and you're trying to do some catch up, you know, like 40, 45, 50, 55. I've seen these work very well. And in some of the defined pension plans, because those funds have to be invested, I've seen real estate, rental properties, other things put into them, but it's a very different dynamic for some of our self-employed. You want to talk to your tax advisors and you also want to talk to your financial advisors to determine what's going to be some of the best options for you when we deal with retirement accounts, because there's so much involved with the pre-tax and deferred tax and then also having your tax free. In my perfect world, I would love to see you go into retirement and we have got two pools of money. I have one pool of money that I have deferred the tax on. So I have a little bit of flexibility on how I'm going to take that money out. The second pool of money that I'd like you to have is your tax-free pool of money. That could be your accounts that have the word Roth in them. It could also be a non-qualified account. And those are terms that are not necessarily interchangeable. Now, the reason for that is when you get into retirement, how the numbers fall on your tax return is going to have a dramatic effect on what you end up paying in your tax liability. And just let me give you one example. If you are a single individual and you earn $25,000 a year, or at present, if you're a married couple and you earn more than $32,500, and that could be from a pension, that could be from taxable interest, it could be from IRA, 401k, those type of deferred tax withdrawals. If you exceed that $25,000 for a single, 
or $32,500 for a married couple, then somewhere between zero and 85% of your social security is going to be taxable. It can also have a domino effect on reducing the amount of medical itemized deductions that you're entitled to. So if we can go into retirement and I have two pools of money we can work with to plan your income stream, then we've got choices about how things fall on the tax return and how much you actually pay for them. Let me give you a little story. I'm going to tell you about Frank. Uh, Frank and I worked together for a very long time. With Frank, got an email one day. Hey, Amy, you know, I want you to take $25,000 out of the IRA. I'm buying a truck. And I sent back a note. Well, Frank, is it a $32,000 truck? I knew the answer was no. Of course, he sent me back a note. Well, no, it's not. I told you it was 25. And I said, well, Frank, you need to pick up the phone and call me. I also managed Frank's portfolio at that time. And I said, Frank, if you make me take this $25,000 that you want out of your retirement account, we're really going to have to take $32,000 in order for me to pay the taxes and take into account the domino effect and changes in what your tax brackets are for you to pay for that $25,000 truck. Frank, is it a $32,000 truck or is it a $25,000 truck? Well, what do you think the answer for? Frank was what we'll call thrifty. I, I really enjoyed Frank and I miss him quite a bit. Frank was never going to pay $32,000 for a $25,000 truck. What we were able to do, since that was a non-deductible expense, is we took the money out of the Roth IRA in this case. So Frank was able to pay $25,000 for the truck just as he intended. Now, I want you to think about one other thing that, you know, most people really forget about. And that has to do with what I will call the hidden cost of every withdrawal. When you take money out of your deferred tax accounts or you take money out of your tax-free accounts, you will never earn another penny of interest on that money. And I really want you to think about that one. So if you took $32,000 out of the account, yes, your balances are going to deplete quicker. And in addition to that, you know, if we were earning 5% a year, uh, quick math, that's about $1,500 in earnings. You're not going to get this year, next year, five year, 10 years down the road. So you can have a tremendous cost that's hidden when you take the withdrawals out on the earnings that you will never receive. Now, if we took it out of the Roth IRA or a non-qualified account, and we were earning that same average of 5%, we only lost about $1,000 of interest. So again, you know, these type of things can make a huge difference now and later on how you structure some of your pre-tax and your after-tax. And then for many of you, you need to have that conversation with a financial advisor, you know, call me, talk to your tax preparer, find out what tax bracket you're in. It may be that a pre-tax account is not a wise choice for you because you're in a very low tax bracket and the Roth would be better for you going forward. Now, in addition to that, there are some special provisions that go along with if you have to take this money out before you're age 59 and a half. In most cases, unless there is a special provision from a disaster or something else, or you qualify for a tax exception, but we're going to believe none of that applies to you. And you're only going to take the money out. You're under age 59 and a half. You're going to pay whatever the tax liability is, and it could bring you up into a higher tax bracket. And then you have an additional 10% penalty on the money. So if I pulled out $50,000, and when I pulled out that $50,000, I paid whatever my income tax rate was. And I'm thinking this is probably going to be 22% and up because you'd have other income that was taxable. And then I also have to pay another $5,000 in the early withdrawal penalty. And if some of you have state income taxes, well, you know, that could be another three to 10%. And we are hoping that you do not have any early withdrawal fees on the investment that you chose. So we could take out a deposit and have to gross it up substantially in order for you to net out the money that you wanted in the first place. So that's one scenario with the deferred tax type assets. 
Now let's go to the other side of the fence and let's look at these a Roth account or a tax-free Roth. Something that is very important. If you don't have it, I want you to construct it. I want you to construct your cost basis in your Roth IRA. That is going to be a spreadsheet or a Word document or something where you can go back and you can uh, write the number down. Okay, in this year, I put in, you know, $5,000. I converted $17,800. In 2020, you know, I added in 2022, da-da-da, so that we know exactly what your contributions and your conversions add up to. Now, why is this important? Let's pretend you are not 59 and a half yet and something has occurred. You really need to take the money out of a retirement account. We're looking at taking out of the Roth. If you have your basis and you withdraw that money from your Roth IRA and you tell and show your tax person what your cost basis is, there is a form that's filled out and you could withdraw up to your basis and incur no tax liability until you touch one penny of the earnings. So let's say that I needed that $50,000 and we know it's going to cost me. I probably am going to have to pull out, you know, easy $70,000 or more out of my IRA in order to net the 50,000 I wanted with all these taxes and fees and things. But your tax person could figure that out for you before you took the money. And if I compare that with the Roth and I needed the 50,000, well, I kept track over the years. And by keeping track over the years, I understood that my basis that I had was $80,000. I could take that $50,000 out and pay no income tax because it's a return of my basis. And then it shows up on my record keeping that $50,000 amount that I've taken. So now my basis has dropped back to $30,000. So you see, it's very powerful how you arrange these pieces and why I really want to see you have a pool of money that you have deferred the tax on and a pool of money that you have no taxes on because it gives us so much more freedom on planning your um, income streams and your resources, but it also gives us a lot more tax control on how much and when you pay the taxes on your money. You know, is that making sense to you? Now, let's go on and let's start talking about a different generation. Maybe you have a child or you have a grandchild and, and you're looking at putting savings accounts in for those individuals. Well, one of the things you could do is an UTMA. It's U-T-M-A, and it stands for Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. Usually what you're transferring are stocks or mutual funds. That's what usually goes into an UTMA. Now, the word transfer is very important because once you transfer the assets to that child, those are not your assets anymore. They belong to the child. So this is indeed a gift that you are giving them. At the present time, there is an exclusion. And so that you can give away up to, I believe it's $16,000 a year with no gift tax consequences. Talk to your tax preparer because I don't know when you may be watching this particular presentation. There's also UGMA, U-G-M-A, which stands for Uniform Gift to Minors Act. Now, when we're giving a gift, this usually is going to be cash that is given, even if it is put into something later. It is cash. So that's going to be an UGMA. You know what else we can use? We can use a 529 college savings plan. Now, the 529 college savings plan allows you to put money in. And then with that, those funds are going to grow tax free as long as they are spent on educational expenses later. Now, one of the things that happened a couple of years ago that is really a boon for a lot of families. At one point, it only covered your college expenses. But you know what now? Now it can be used for primary, junior high, and high school private educations. So there can be a real uh, benefit to some families where you can have, you know, individuals donating or letting that money accrue that you know you're going to spend. So the five college, uh, 529 college savings account, you know, those can be an excellent option for you. I also want you to check with the state that you live in because the state that you live in could have some special provisions for 529. 
I'm going to throw one example out there that I'm familiar with, and it's Kansas. Now, Kansas has a Learning Quest program. Other states have their own. But on the Learning Quest program, if your income in a household falls below a certain level, they will match your contributions dollar for dollar up to $600 per beneficiary. So let's think about this. Let's pretend that I have Aunt Edna and Aunt Edna fits the income guidelines, but she's not really, you know, in a position to give a lot of money away. Aunt Edna could be the person who lived in Kansas, who takes and she is the owner of these accounts and the parents or someone gives her the money to put in at least $600 per child so that they can have that $600 matching money. Isn't that phenomenal? Now, you have to put in applications for this. It's something the legislature has been approving from year to year, but it's a very successful program. Now, in addition to that, in the state of Kansas, if you put money into a 529 account, there can be up to a $3,000 deduction that you take off of your state income taxes per beneficiary. So if you're looking at college savings and that's where we're going, check into your state laws. Also check into some of the states that you may have family members with programs similar to Kansas that could really help increase the ability to pay for these educations later using those matching funds. And the way that the matching funds work is let's pretend that I have a $2,000 college expense. I would turn that in and I would get half of it or $1,000 from my account that I contributed to. And I'd get the other $1,000 from the matching account. So I couldn't eliminate all of the matching account first and then take mine. It has to be equal. The other thing that we can do going forward, what happens if I put the name on as a grandchild, as a beneficiary, and well, you know, this child's never going to go to college. It's not going to happen. So what do we do now? Well, you have the ability to change the beneficiary on that 529 account. Maybe you put the beneficiary as another grandchild or a child who is going to college or a grandchild. Maybe it's on yourself and you decide to go back and get a degree. So we've got a lot of flexibility on changing the beneficiary on these accounts. Now, if it is a matching type account and you change the beneficiary, well, then you lose all of the matching. So you have to understand what those parameters are before you would change a beneficiary to make sure that you don't undo something that was really not what you had in mind. Here's another idea. Let's say that I have a child or a grandchild who still has $5,000 left in their 529 that, you know, they just didn't need it. They were, we got scholarships or whatever the case may be. There's nothing that says we can't leave it in that child's name indefinitely. And then what if they bless us with a grandchild? Well, maybe we put the grandchild's name on it. And then that $5,000 would be allowed to grow. And we've got, you know, another 18 years for it to accumulate tax-free to use for education later. So a 529 account, if you use them the right way, can be a phenomenal way to bring additional wealth into the family with some of these matching programs and then the tax-free earnings on it and the flexibility on beneficiaries. So don't skip the 529s wherever you are. They can serve a, a very valid purpose. If you decide to liquidate the account, and it's not going to be used for educational expenses, well, then you got to pay the taxes on all of the accrued earnings. They would not be tax-free at that point, but you still have an out that can be used at that point. It's also very important that we spend a minute and we talk about how a 529 may impact your college aid. Mm -hmm.